Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. Our speaker today is Ekaterina Chopanova from the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures at KU. And the title of her talk is to the problem of narrative distance and two fantastic stories by Alexander Pushkin, Resisting Horror Through Carnival. Before I introduce um, uh, Katya Chilpanova, let me just mention a few events that we have uh, going on in November. So on Thursday, uh, here in this room, we'll have a screening of a movie from Turkey titled Mustang. This is at 7 p.m. on November 7th. And um, Dr. Ezra Predilak will be here and uh, also uh, a Fulbright fellow from Turkey will introduce the film. On uh, Tuesday, November 12th, that is in a week, Professor uh, Maya Kip will give a brown bag lecture titled Alexander Gold's Military Reform and Militarism in Russia, One Book's Journey into the English-Speaking World. And on Thursday, November 14th, uh, Professor Vitaly Chernetsky will be introducing and screening a Russian movie titled First on the Moon by Alexei Fedorchenko. And this is happening in the Burge Union, 4NB, at 7 p.m. Uh, and also just to uh, be done with November because of the Thanksgiving break, our last brown bag will be on Tuesday, November 19th. It will be presented by Robert Jameson, a graduate student in the Department of History. And the title of his lecture is A Network or a Leash, Computing Through the Iron Curtain in the 1980s. So this is our roster for November. And now um, let me introduce our speaker. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Yekaterina Chilpanova is a graduate of St. Petersburg State University, where she studied medieval art. She's currently a PhD candidate at the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures at KU. Her dissertation is about post-war Soviet cinema and literature, and her second interest is in the 19th century Gothic tradition and the Russian literature, as well as Gothicism and comparative perspective. In her research, she focuses on the history of emotions, and she brings the approaches from this field to the field of Slavic studies. She uses theories of embodied spectatorship, Elsier, Hagener, Sobchak, and embodied reading, for example, Fludernik, to explore how people interact with art on the bodily subconscious level and how this interaction determines the emotional expression. Um, so please join me in welcoming Katya Shilpanova. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, today I will present a book which is uh, still in progress. It's not a part of my dissertation. It's rather uh, my side interest, which is also very important for me. And I'm hoping to develop uh, this piece into the article in the future, it's re re hopefully soon. And today I'm very much also looking forward to the feedback. Uh, today I will address uh, the problem of interactivity of uh, two Pushkin's uh, fantastic stories, uh, The Coffin Maker, Grebovshik, and uh, The Queen of Spades, uh, Pikova Dama. Uh, in, re in, uh, in, in his work, Rebelais and His World, Mikhail Bakhtin claims that during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance as well, uh, macabre or Gothic tradition within the folk culture functioned as a device uh, which uh, helped people not only address the anxieties and existential fears, like the fear of death or the fear of eternal punishment or um, the state hierarchy or the church hierarchy, but according to Bakhtin, uh, this macabre tradition also helped people exercise their fears and anxieties and uh, transform them into their creative energy uh, and liberate themselves. He means a temporary feeling of liberation from hierarchy, but at the same time he also means some kind of inner liberation. Uh, and he argues that um, this liberation would happen through 
phenomenological interaction with this uh, folk tradition and specifically the medieval macabre carnival. Um, and uh, what is interesting that Bakhtin tries to connect uh, aesthetics to psychology uh, and build this kind of bridge, which also I will try to uh, to build today, relying on uh, Bakhtin's uh, theory. Uh, so I will explore how uh, um, interaction with these two stories um, by Pushkin on the existential level, phenomenologically helps the reader achieve the condition which uh, Bakhtin names the condition of fearlessness. So in the course of my presentation, I will use this word uh, several times and uh, will try to uh, better understand uh, what this means. Uh, yeah, so, uh, oh, I'm just trying to click my slide. It should. It has just clicked before. <laughs> but what is now? Sure. Sorry. It has just it was just fine a minute ago, but yeah, I don't know what yeah, it's not no? fine now, apparently. But it, it, it has been perfect. Uh just uh, Uh -huh. manager here. Amigo, maybe you can continue now. Okay. Find someone. Sure, yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, both stories, uh, the coffin maker and uh, the queen of spades, are concerned with uh, one problem. This is the problem of uh, um, coexistence of uh, two principles which guide the human uh, fate. Uh, in this life. Uh, the first principle is fatum in the antique sense, or what is called in Russian rok. And the second principle is uh, the divine coincidence, uh, or slučaj. Uh, and Natalia Mazur, who uh, does the historical research about Pushkin, argues that Pushkin was personally very much concerned with this problem of uh, coexistence of coincidence and fatum on the other side. Uh, he would read uh, philosophers uh, who address that topic, especially Helvetius, who claimed that coincidences and paradoxes objectively exist. They are, just, they are not just a product of uh, human fantasy. They play an important part in history, um, especially in the history of scientific discoveries and uh, creativity. Uh, and Pushkin agreed with uh, Helvetius on the point that um, coincidence and happy co coincidence really objectively exists. He called it, uh, in some of his writings, he called it Arudia Previdenia, what is like the divine hand, can be translated like that. Uh, on the other hand, Pushkin had doubts about uh, this issue because he also uh, asserted um, the existence of fatum in the antique sense of this world. Fatum like unknown force which guides uh, the human fate and which cannot be uh, controlled. And uh, Mazur suggests that Pushkin was also personally concerned with the uh, person's ability to increase the power of uh, coincidence, случай uh, or happy divine hand in one particular human life. Uh, also, uh, the historical research has shown that uh, Pushkin was interested in late antique ideas of uh, influencing one's fate through mastering particular psychological skills. The tradition of Stoicism in late antiquity um, would 
offer such an opportunity, uh, and especially the writings by Marcus Aurelius. This tradition, in a certain way, echoes the tradition of Buddhism, because Marcus and Aurelius and other Stoics argued that uh, through mastering psychological skills, and especially the skill of distancing from the emotional turmoil, obsessions, and wishes as well, the person can liberate himself or, him or herself from the power of the natural law, and through that also fr from the power of fatum. Uh, and Mazur Forest research uh, has shown that Pushkin was influenced by the Stoicism on, on the personal level, just like many other Russian intellectuals of the early 19th century. And also she argues that uh, certain poems by Pushkin reveal the influence of this spiritual tradition, and Marcus Aurelius specifically. Uh, so uh, relying on this uh, idea, I argue that uh, Pushkin's uh, uh, short stories aim at, uh, aim at helping the reader master particular psychological skills, uh, and uh, especially the skill of distancing from, from the emotional turmoil and acquiring the control over overwhelming anxieties, especially the anxiety of, uh, related to the, to the fatum and uncon uncontrollable uh, force of fatum which guides the human life. I don't argue that Pushkin's stories will provide the solution to the antinomy of fatum and coincidence on the rational level. Not on the rational level, because on the rational level this problem is unsolvable, according to Pushkin. But rather I argue that on the the existential or like phenomenological interaction with these two stories um, helps the person address uh, this problem, this unsolvable issue, not on the rational level, but rather on the existential level and emotional level, and uh, discover some paradoxical uh, conclusions. Uh, so we can, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, it's switched now. So, Is it the slide you want? Oh, okay. That's my second slide. And now uh, I am. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, contemporary uh, narratology uh, contains particular theories, such as the theory of Fludernik, uh, which can be called experiential theories. Uh, Fludernik tries to approach the literary narrative not as a disclose of information in a traditional way, but rather as a creation of a particular experience, or better to say, a set of experiences for the reader and also maybe for the writer. Uh, and I will use this theory uh, um, today also in my presentation. Uh, I will try to look at Pushkin's narrative from this point of view as an attempt to create a series of experiences. Uh, with a particular goal. Uh, Bakhtin also, I think Bakhtin uh, would agree with these contemporary narratologists because Bakhtin also claims that art uh, is not a disclose of information but rather creation of a series of experiences, uh, such as, for instance, the experience of medieval carnival, according to Bakhtin, would create the experience of fearlessness. Okay. Mm -hmm. how, how will Pushkin create this experience of fearlessness in his two fantastic stories? Uh, I argue that uh, Pushkin does it uh, through the use of the device known as the narrative distance. Uh, there are several theories of narrative distance in contemporary narratology. Uh, the theory which I like mostly uh, this is the theory by Andringa, uh, argues that uh, narrative distance is uh, bringing into uh, the reader's attention the, narr the narrator's ability for control over the story. Uh, Carl Jung also addressed the problem of narrative distance in art. Jung argues that narrative distance exists not only in literature but also in visual image, imagery, in visual image. Mm, he called the 
uh, narrative distance abstraction, the, paradigm, the interactivity, interactivity paradigm abstraction. And he argued that this paradigm, or, or rather interaction with art, with a narrative distance, uh, helps uh, the participant uh, acquire better exercise, uh, such a skill as uh, acquiring control over emotion. Um, the art with a lower degree of narrative distance, according to Carl Jung, help, helps us exercise uh, such, a, such a skill as empathy. So when we feel close uh, to the narrative, or like, or like taken inside the narrative, or inside the image, we are kind of merged by that image, or by the narrative, and we empathize, and we, according to Jung, we continue ourselves into this image or into this narrative, uh, while uh, narrative distance is, is rather pushing away the reader or the spectator from the image. Um, and he also thought that like religious art, medieval art, this is the art with a very high degree of distance, narrative distance. It's not the empathetic paradigm at all. So I argue that in the two fantastic stories, uh, the coffin maker and the queen of spades, uh, Pushkin uh, uses not the device of empathy, but rather the interactivity paradigm of the distance. Uh, how does this distance work? Uh, first of all, in the opening of the Queen of Spades, it's very hard to identify the focalizer. Focalizer, uh, in narratology, focalizer, that's the point of view. When we read the text, uh, we cannot understand what is going on if we don't uh, imagine whose point of view we face. We need to imagine that. We, uh, sometimes we make mistakes with that, of course, because it's hard. But we need to imagine the point of view in order to understand what is going on. In the opening of Pushkin's text, it's, it's very hard to understand whose point of view uh, we face, because uh, Pushkin um, uses the sentences without a subject. So he creates the illusion of the narrative without a narrator, where the, where, where the narrator tries, tries to hide himself or herself. That is the example. I used here I use the Russian variant because, unfortunately, in the English translation, this effect um, disappears, uh, especially in those translations which I found. Uh, in Russian, um, here, this problem with focalization, like zero focalization, uh, stems from uh, the use of sentences without uh, subject. Uh, when it's not clear who does the action, and um, when it is not clear enough uh, who actually uh, who actually is saying that, uh, so you see there are verbs: играли, сели, те, остались, but we don't know who who is те because like nobody presented us any character at this point. It's the opening paragraph. Uh, okay. This paragraph is uh, followed by uh, the series of replicas, uh, which go one after another and without, almost without any narrator's comments. Narrator um, is not, uh, is not uh, uh, presenting the, the characters' replicas. And as I found out, uh, the characters' man of speech is very unnatural. Uh, these, uh, the participants of that dialogue would be Herman, one of the characters, then uh, Tomsky, uh, who, would, who is the first one to present the old countess. Uh, and uh, Herman speaks with uh, puzzles. His first replica is very hard to understand uh, because uh, uh, he articulates a puzzle, like Zagatka. Uh, and at this point, it's not, it's not possible for the reader to understand what is meant by that. Uh, and then Tomsky all of a sudden presents the old countess who appears to
to be his babushka, his uh, grandmother. But uh, Tomsky, when he starts to speak, he speaks like a professional writer, not like we speak in, in our everyday lives. Because he relies on multiple rumors, he um, refers to multiple historical period, like Middle Ages, multiple cultures like France, uh, other nations, other countries, uh, and multiple rumors. Uh, and uh, I would say that here, uh, because of that, uh, the reader has a problem not only with identifying uh, the focalizer, but also with, I with identifying the location of this whole scene, like where exactly uh, the action takes place. Like if we if we didn't know from the very beginning that it's written in Russian, it would be hard for us to understand that it's actually the, the action takes place in Russia because Tomsky in his speech uh, refers to other countries and uh, non-Russian setting at all, and the narrator doesn't say anything about where uh, it is going on. Uh, so what kind of narrative uh, do we face in the opening of the Queen of Spades? Uh, Gerard Jeanette, uh, who is one of the famous uh, narratologists now, uh, uh, and Norman Friedman, uh, the other narratologist, contemporary narratologist, uh, argue that uh, this is the type of narrative which resembles a quick and distant summary. So the narr narrator's comments in the opening of the Queen of Spades really uh, matches that category. Quick, distant su summary. Uh, Friedman also, uh, Norman Friedman arg uh, argues that this type of uh, narrator's uh, comments can be called an extremely objectified narrator. The narrator who tries to withdraw himself as if he's not present there. No emotional comments about uh, the characters, like no presentation of the characters and a natural manner of speech of the characters also. And uh, uh, also this is the situation which matches uh, Jeanette's uh, situation uh, which she defines as zero focalization or God's point of view, when the narrator tries to eliminate himself as much as possible, to the maximum possible degree. I called this situation, like I personally called it in my piece, a camera eye. Uh, because uh, this situation is, uh, can be compared with a camera which shed lights on the theatre stage. And so we are sitting in the theatre and uh, we are looking at the stage, but nobody is presenting anything. Like we, uh, we see just the figures start moving and start doing something, but at this point we don't know what is going to happen. And the narrator, Pushkin's narrator, tries to resemble this uh, non-emotional and non-judgmental camera eye, which just sheds the light. Uh, and uh, Jeanette and Friedman argue that this is the situation of extreme distance. This is an extremely distancing narrator, according to them. Uh, in uh, Grabovshik, however, in The Undertaker, the situation of uh, narrative distance is constructed differently. Uh, there uh, it's just differently. If here we, in the Queen of Spades, we see the narrator who tries to eliminate his presence uh, or hide his presence. In uh, the Coffin Maker, we see the narrator who constantly interferes into the story. How does he interfere? Uh, I will show right now. Uh, this is the citation from Pushkin. Very opening of the Coffin Maker. Uh, the cultivated reader is aware that both Shakespeare and Walter Scott portrayed their grave diggers as cheery, uh, fa facetious. facetious individuals, so that our imagination might be uh, the more affected by antithesis. Out of respect for the truth, we are unable to follow the example, and are compelled to admit that the demeanor of our undertaker was wholly appropriate to his gloomy profession. So here, what, what, what happens here? It's the opening and uh, it's not the only example uh, from the opening. This is another example also from the opening of uh, the coffin maker. Uh, look at that one also. Deviating in this instance from the custom of modern day novelists, 
I will refrain from describing Adrian Prokhorov's kaftan or the European attire of Akulina and Daria. I consider it relevant, however, to point out that both girls had put on yellow hats and red shoes, which um, they didn't really have on festive occasions. Uh, so what, uh, what uh, this is an extremely like interfering narrator, which uh, mm, who uh, he pretends, this narrator pretends that he opens his creative kitchen or a like, creative workshop like in front of the reader and he's like making, um, uh, trying to say that, hey, like, yeah, let me show like how I cook like my dish, like my creative piece. And like instead of uh, instead of producing empathy on the characters, uh, the reader is rather exposed to uh, uh, to this workshop, to this very uh, process of crafting the story, art, art craft, and see how many references to the world literatures are here. Like the whole list, there are like you can we can if calculate even like the set of writers who are mentioned here, and that will be a lot of a lot of writers and a lot of uh, literary pieces. So and then, as a result, uh, how does the reader feel about the uh, characters? Uh, the characters uh, here they are more like marionettes because this interfering narrator from the coffin maker. He, uh, he emphasizes, with, with that interference, he emphasizes his ability to control the story, to control that he is the one who controls. The story is not happening by itself, but the story is a product of his creative workshop or like creative kitchen. And we are exposed to this control, like very much. Uh, also psychological distance from characters, because uh, in the previous citation, uh, I showed you that uh, the narrator emphasized that all the characters are a product of his manipulation, like his craft. They are like his marionettes. Uh, and there, and uh, also narrator like shares his pleasure from his ability to manipulate the story. And I think, like I suggest at this point, uh, that the reader would take the narrator's side subconsciously and he would relate uh, to this feeling of pleasure from the ability to control this performative space of the story. Uh, another uh, way to create uh, the narrative distance in the two stories is uh, the device of theatricality, extreme visuality, as well as the blurring borders of time and space. Theatricality, I would say that most uh, scholars of both literature and film uh, at this point argue that uh, theatricality uh, uh, creates the narrative distance because uh, uh, theatricality of the narr narrative creates the effect of carnival or like performance which is going on and when we engage with that we also feel like participants of the carnival which is going on uh, so that's not the situation of empathy at all uh, and theatricality usually uh, like goes hand in hand with extreme visuality uh, how does uh, the visuality and th theatricality how do they operate in Pushkin's narrative uh, light setting and so-called alive colors. Uh, oh, okay, I think I I should give you example of the light light setting. Uh, light setting is uh, especially interesting. I think in the uh, in the Undertaker uh, because uh, look. Uh, there is a, so much attention on light in both the Gothic parts of the Queen of Spades and also in the whole narrative of the Undertaker. Just one example. Uh, when Adrian, the coffin maker, wake, wakes up outside, it was still dark. 
uh, Truchiner's corpse, which he saw in a dream, was yellow as wax, uh, and the candles burned. Uh, and as long as this narrator sets the light very, very properly, uh, we, we have the impression that the colors are alive, as if we could touch them. Uh, and it's definitely the, the, the situation of the very, according to Fludernik, this is the situation of a very extreme embodied reading. Like we enjoy like our ability to touch like all those colors, like experience this. It's also when Herman is uh, standing under the lantern, like before he goes into the countess house also the light is set very properly in all the details and um, the reader experiences this pleasure from embodiment from the embodied reading on the other hand like he never forgets that this is a controlled space uh, like a narrator he is in a privileged position in compared to the characters because the characters like the undertaker this poor adrian or like poor herman they will be uh, subject to fatum rock uh, while the reader and the narrator are on the other side. They are like on the safe side uh, because because uh, like uh, our narrator showed that he can manipulate the story and also he showed that characters such as marionettes in those gothic parts and so uh, we kind of face it and participate in that but uh, we never lose this uh, safe position like very safe and very privileged compare to the characters who would suffer from Fatum, like all of them. Adrian would suffer and, uh, and uh, Herman would ver very badly suffer, uh, as you know. Uh, another device of theatricality is rhythmization of the narrative and both the characters' speech. Uh, here you can see one of Herman's replicas. Uh, if, 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 if. So uh, it sounds like uh, the replica in antique tragedy. Or, or, or like in medieval literature when like the same verse repeats multiple times. It's rhythmicized and uh, it's perceived as a theatrical speech, not as natural speech. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's also like prevents us from empathy while on the other hand uh, lets us perceive the space of the story as a very theatrical space, as a carnivalesque space, as I argue. Um, so these are some conclusions uh, I made. Uh, the pleasure, f the reader's pleasure from experiencing this world and like embodied reading, uh, and uh, the privileged, the, re the reader's privileged position of the control. Like macabre and gothic world is the world which is taken under control, and only the characters suffer there, but not the narrator or the reader. Uh, one more tool of creating the narrative distance is blurring borders of time and space. Uh, this device is directly taken from medieval grotesque and uh, 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 Bakhtin uh, explored that very well in, in Rabelais and his world. He argues that in Gothic literature starting from Middle Ages, um, you know, the goal was to create the illusion of eliminating the, uh, the border between the condition of life and condition of death. Uh, they become kind of transparent. Uh, and uh, you saw in Pushkin's narrative uh, the situation with Truhina's corpse in, in The Undertaker very well illustrates that because uh, she was lying like a wax color but uh, devoid of of uh, signs of deteriorating. Besledovt uh, linea in the Russian variant, but wax color. Uh, our like old countess in the Queen of Spades, she constantly travels from the condition of life to the condition of death, here and there, here and there. When she's still alive, the narrator refers her face as dead. Well, when she dies, she uh, acquires even more power compared to the situation when she was weak and alive. Because after she dies, she can punish Herman eventually and arrange the uh, fate of his mistress. So uh, as a reader, I think, like subconsciously, the reader perceives this world as the world where the border between the condition of life and the condition of death is eliminated. So this condition of death is no more fatal. It's, it, it's transparent. 
Uh, and the same uh, illusion would happen in medieval grotesque as well. And Bakhtin thinks that um, this illusion would help, the, would help the participant of the carnival experience uh, mm, this uh, like existential uh, condition of fearlessness, like uh, looking at the death as something which is not fatal anymore. Uh, so he, some examples, yeah, yellow and wax corpse, but undefiled by decay. Uh, and uh, the countess face as well, dead, but animated, and then like vice versa. So this is effect on the reader, my conclusion, yeah. And then uh, the story of Lizaveta Ivanovna in uh, The Queen of Spades, there is a an immediate and very extreme uh, transition from the narrative distance to the extremely empathetic narrator when it comes to the story of Lizaveta Ivanovna. Uh, the narrator becomes very empathetic, he gets in into Lizaveta Ivanovna and uh, he openly shows that he empathizes for her. All these theatricality disappears all of a sudden, like normal light setting, a very natural uh, flow of narrative, more like realistic type of the narrative. Uh, Earlier, most of the scholars argued that uh, here Pushkin exercised the transition between the romantic code and the realistic code. And I don't agree with that because I don't think that it's exercise for the sake of the exercise. I rather think that it's juxtaposition of two worlds, like one world of Fatum, which is the Gothic world, macabre world, and the other world of Lizaveta Ivanovna, which is the world of divine coincidence, because she's the one who deserved in the end. Uh, divine coincidence and arranged her life very well. And uh, our narrator openly shows that he, bl uh, he um, admires her psychological abilities. And her main psychological ability is the ability to distance from the turmoil of fate, because her fate from the very beginning was very hard. But she uh, mastered the skill to distance from that. Uh, and she just accepted the life as it is and like not invested that those difficult conditions with uh, emotional uh, turmoil. And like in the end, according to the narrator, she uh, she's blessed by this coincidence, like by this sluchi, and arranges her life and gets rid of the state of the mistress. And uh, on, uh, on the contrary, the, the characters who, who inhabit the Gothic world, like Adrian Prokhorov and uh, like Herman, they all suffer from obsessions. So they all are obsessed by something, like Adrian is obsessed by money. Uh, and then uh, Herman is obsessed by controlling uh, cards, yes, it's situ a situation with cards and also money, of course. Uh, and they, they cannot distance from that, like not even from a second, like they're constantly thinking about like some problem they have. And that's why they are degraded by the narrator and like shown as marionettes. And that what's, that's why I think like in Pushkin's world, they deserve the Fatum, like they are punished by Fatum, like both those characters. Uh, and I think that Pushkin, uh, uh, for the reader, he creates the world where um, we as readers have an illusion that uh, one can control and like willfully transition from the space of Fatum to the space of divine justice. Because uh, if you look at the very closing sentence of the Queen of Spades, the closing senten uh, sentence directly juxtaposes Lizaveta Ivanovna and Herman. So the narrator, without any emotions, just says that Lizaveta is living happily and Herman uh, ends up his life in a, ma in a mental hospital. So like direct just ex the juxtaposition of two principles. And also I think that Elizaveta Ivanovna is, uh, is a real stoic, I think. She's like a real stoic and because uh, she's the one who uh, trained her ability for emotional distancing. Uh, and uh, here is my conclusion that also the stories communicate to the reader the idea that the ability for emotional distancing or rather emotional withdrawal from particular situation or particular problem or, 
or even the narrative, yeah, and taking the privileged position like the narrator who can control the space of the story is a rewarding quality which uh, in the end brings to uh, um, to increasing the chances for divine justice or happy coincidence. This is the end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yeah. I'm sorry I missed the beginning. That was mm -hmm. fascinating. Thank I, you. I feel I'm just starting to understand literary criticism. <laughs> you made something very clear to me. It made me wonder though, what was Pushkin's what was going on in Pushkin's life that wanted him to tell this story? Oh yeah. Uh, I, uh, I, um, the historical research by Natalia Mazur shows that he also, uh, like, he was concerned with this uh, fatum yeah. problem, and uh, he was, by the way, he was very superstitious. Like all the mem memorials uh, emphasize that, like he kind of believed in the existence of Fatum. And on the other hand, he wanted to be blessed by the coincidence. Like he would, like reading the French philosophers, yeah, because it's not like we are not far away from the age of enlightenment. So like it's still this, um, like investing the human with the ability to like control the fate um, was like, uh, was like imagined as very important. And uh, some of his notes show that uh, he, like, he was concerned how can the human like increase uh, chances for, for uh, happy coincidence and like escape that fatum. Uh, and uh, here he constructs, I think, the world where, depending on their psychological skills, the characters get either the fatum or the happy coinci coincidence. Mm -hmm. So he believed in an afterlife? Uh, I think he, he uh, used different, relied on different spiritual traditions. I think uh, he, like, just like in his poetry, he draws on like multiple traditions. So it's definitely the antique tradition, for sure. Uh, in, in general, like I mean, because he associated himself with like famous antique poets uh, like Horatio, Ovid, like and many others. And at the same time, Mazur argues that he uh, wanted to uh, associate himself with the Stoic philosophers, like Marcus Aurelius, like someone who is above the power of natural law. Uh, and she, uh, she just, she, uh, as long as she explored th that theme of Pushkin and Stoicism, she um, names the poem where he directly imagines himself as a Stoic. As a Stoic, he is, who is capable of like emotional control on the high level. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, my question is about the undertaker as being mm -hmm. one of the Bilkin's Tales mm -hmm. um, stories. And Speaking from like the narrative perspective, so we, the, um, as you said, the narrative distancing mm -hmm. and um, theatrical presentation, and like, what role do you think um, Pushkin's story about the story plays? So like, he says that you know there are multiple sources through which the story passed uh, before getting to us as readers. He says that, like, oh, first, like, Bilkin wrote it, and then Bilkin mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. heard it from some butler. Clearly, we see that this language is not, like, probably a butler's language, because, like, I mentioned Shakespeare and, like, all the, um, you know, uh, literary traditions. So why do you think it was necessary to present it as if it was, like, told by someone else who's heard it from somebody else? I think it's also uh, the, the theatricality, I think, and uh, the distance, but also I think emphasis on, on the theatricality and probably also uh, the performative space, I think, emphasizing uh, the situation of this performative space. I know there are some works which argue that uh, it's also uh, maybe this, uh, there is something from a fairy tale there as well, uh, but I, I'm not really ready at this point to like go into in, in depth analysis of uh, relationship to the fairy tale because I think it's a little bit different question. 
because like my question is rather about the narrative distance. Uh, but I think that rumors, uh, I think that Janet, actually Gerard Janet, I think directly says that uh, like multiple rumors uh, increases the effect of distance. Because you have frame within mm -hmm. frame within a frame. Oh yeah. It distances you from the little mm -hmm. kernel that's inside. Definitely, yeah. So I have a question. So that was fascinating. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think uh, there's so much there. Um, and you can, of course, expand and explore. So my question is about um, the reader. Mm -hmm. so you say a lot uh, often, you know, this is the story that creates this kind of effect for a reader, for the reader, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering to what extent it's possible to, and if you've thought about this, to, to speak about the reader, you know, the general reader. For example, to give you a specific example, do you think we as contemporary readers read this story in the same way as the Pushkin's contemporaries? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, for example, as you were talking about this experience of fearlessness, mm -hmm. I thought, okay, so in order for a story to create for me an experience of fearlessness, it also has to scare me. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, mm -hmm. have an effect that will distance me from this fear. Mm -hmm. So to what extent do these stories scare us? Or do we read them now as 21st century readers is more you know entertaining playful and if that's the case then maybe they don't create they, they're not as effective for us in creating this experience of fearlessness mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i mean I've, it's a broad question but maybe you've thought about it a little bit oh yeah I, uh thank you very much for your question uh um I think it's uh, it's actually it's a it's a big problem with uh, applying the uh, theories of both embodied spectatorship and embodied reading because uh, uh, also reading tradition depends on the historical context very much, and for sure and it's quite hard for us to access uh, directly the. Um, the perception of the early 19th century reader. Because honestly, I've been searching for a long time. I've been searching any, at least anything, about the traditions of reading in the early 19th century. I found something. So I found something, at least one article. I cannot say that I found much on that point, but one article I found uh, about the tradition, how people, how did people read? So. Like not, not not actually many articles like would raise that question. Uh, so one article argued. Uh, unfortunately, for now I don't remember the author, but it was really just one article. And that article argued that in Pushkin's time, actually Russian art, uh, Russian writers had a hard time accessing the market of literature uh, because uh, that's that's like a real challenge. Like he he needed to access that, and we know that he was very ambitious, of course, super ambitious, and uh, and it's understandable. And it, it was very hard for the Russian writer to compete with the European writers because because that scholar who calculated uh, the um, the authors whom people actually read, I think, as far as I remember, probably the writer would use our, uh, the author would use archives, probably, like actually showing what people read. And uh, even like the highest uh, intellectual society of Russia of that time would not read uh, Russian authors. They would not like for us now. Like Pushkin is like a classical writer, and uh, like we imagine that everybody would read him, but that was not the case. Rather, uh, Russians would read the uh, European novels and they were like awaiting them and they were uh, European authors whom we, we don't know now, like we don't remember much about them right now, but they were super popular in that time. Uh, I suggest uh, that Pushkin uh, tried to confront some kind of patterns or patterns of reading of that time. Because I think he was kind of annoyed by by the situation of having difficulty with accessing the market, actually, and I think it could it could uh, to a certain extent maybe explain why he refers to reading so much in his works, like directly referring to art of literature, like making literature and also li reading in literature. And he's not saying that directly, of course, but he's saying that in a playful form and in Anegin as well, like multiple times, like 
like hey like people do not read in a sophisticated way like they read in a primitive way and like I'm and like this narrator of Pushkin's narrating both Anegin and in The Undertaker as well I think he tries to create his own image as a like very sophisticated image very sophisticated someone who knows how to read and also how to write and uh, the figure of kind of authority and I think he tries to communicate that like like how I'm going to to teach you how to read mm -hmm. but of course indirectly not like directly saying that but indirectly well much of his uh, output as it is is mm -hmm. about the process of of reading right and you're probably familiar but there's a lot of information in the book uh, by William Milstad the third mm -hmm. taught at Harvard the book is fiction and society in the age of Pushkin and it's all mm -hmm. about I mean the the um, it's not in the book, but the title that Bill Todd uses for this book is How Russia Learned to Read, right? Mm -hmm, and it's mm -hmm. about the rise of the institutions of literature. Mm -hmm. So the almanacs, the journals, the idea of a subscription mm -hmm. to a journal, mm -hmm. yeah. libraries, first bookstores mm -hmm. appear in Russia, right? And this is how readership is kind of slowly being forged. And I think, uh, Justin, I think also that uh, continuing with answering Alexandra's question, I think that also from 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 how much I know um, the Russian early 19th century society would uh, be uh, would is more likely to uh, to be more skilled in the tradition of empathetic reading rather than unempathetic reading because here we we need to experience unempathetic reading mm -hmm. uh, and uh, like reading for empathy for like uh, experiencing f pleasure from empathy was more uh, was more common at that time i think mm -hmm. because which may go back to for example sentimentalism which precedes definitely I, and, and as far as i know from from what i know the tradition of sentimentalism although now like as for researchers for us it seems like oh that's the past epoch but it doesn't mean that the audience would at that time would know that oh that's the past epoch that's that, that was the most recent <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, right? yeah. And, mm -hmm. and also i think the social context of course is important that you alluded to that really the readers were only aristocrats basically mm -hmm. and that was uh you know percentage of society and, and single digits and also for many of them French was essentially their first language and that's why when you talked about that they you know they were more um, familiar with European authors that's where it comes from because they had access they knew French right and mm -hmm. or, or, mm -hmm. or they were bi bilingual but um, there was this kind of cultural barrier to actually reading in, in Russian at least well, sure. Slightly earlier, like but at the beginning of the 19th century. Yeah. So, yeah. so that was kind of a new experience, I think, to encounter a text that would be very complex on the narrative level, but written in Russian. And, and I think for me, you know, when you're describing it, I mean, and I think it's great to talk about Eugene Onyekin as well. I think. I think Pushkin's the kind of writer who's very aware of his skill and his genius. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. for me, he's kind of a peacock. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can do this. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can construct that many narrators. I can do all those narrative tricks. Um, and that was, well, I mean. And I think that from what we know about Pushkin, uh, he, uh, like in his everyday life, he enjoyed his uh, skill of also like making performance even like yeah, making so performance like he, around his own personality. Uh, I think he's creating a spectacle within the text around the way the story is told. I think right? so, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very, mm -hmm. very complex. I mean, even I think for us today, and we've all come across various narrative techniques, I think it's still very impressive what he does. And also every text is different, right? He doesn't. I mean, he doesn't really repeat his tricks. He he shows us the full range. So, so I'm really glad that you chose to oh, focus thank on this you. because this is this is one of his tricks. By the way, I I don't know whether for us it is uh, fearful or not fearful. I really don't know. I think for me it's not fearful. Uh, I'm not sure how I can measure it exactly. I mean. 
Like, I mean, as it refers to his original audience, I guess from memoirs, and like if anyone yeah, kept memoirs, notes on the reading um, process, yeah, or anything like that, maybe, yeah, memoirs, or I don't know, maybe there are some notes of performances mm -hmm. or letters, right, mm -hmm. where they yeah. exchange yeah. opinions about yeah. how this performance went over or something like that. Yeah. And they share their impressions of reading a story. Mm -hmm. or, yeah, so letters and memoirs would be probably the best bet. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think that uh, like there is so much humor in there, even Truhina, like this surname Truhina, it literally is uh, from the word Truha. No, Truha, it's like a tree where bugs live. Mm -hmm. It's not very high level. It really sounds funny in Russian. Kupchiha mm Truhina, -hmm. that sounds really funny. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not like something it's it's like you can feel that humor i think mm -hmm. uh but on the other hand it's very embodied it's very embodied like we uh it's it's humorous space but it's also very embodied space that gothic space mm -hmm. with a proper light setting and we can really like experience that mm -hmm. uh and experiencing is very important here mm -hmm. uh Any questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming.